thanks to cell phones and social media, it's easier than ever to talk to people all over the world whenever you want to, obviously. But it's not working exactly as you would expect. Today's teenagers are the loneliest generation in American history. In 2017, for example, teens met with friends 68 fewer times than they did in 1990. Children have fewer friends, but more anxiety. They have fewer dates, but more depression. Suicide rates are rising. Uh, that is Tucker Carlson. He always likes to take some uh, an interesting angle on society and get off politics. And uh, Allison and uh, Eric and Pete came up with this idea because Dr. Drew's here now to talk about society in general and get off the play-by-play of impeachment. And Dr. Drew, you're kind of relieved to take on a very serious subject. Yes. Do you? Do you? From what you know personally, mm-hmm. uh, anecdotally, do those numbers line up with what you think? Precisely. That, that is not a surprise at but all. why we're so hooked up? We're hooked up to, to a pseudo, pseudo, pseudo intimacy. This is not real intimacy. And because these kids are so locked into that electronic exchange, when they're developing, they're not as prone to developing the, the ability to develop connections with their peers. So the usual milestones of, say, romantic uh, experiences like dating and hooking and whatever it is, they don't do it. They just skip it, and then all of a sudden they're in your young adulthood, and they've not developed the capacity for intimate connections, essentially, real intimate connections. And true intimacy with human beings is always two bodies in space, always. You can't do that electronically. What you're getting electronically is some sense of kind of closeness, but it's pseudo, and it does not have the same health benefits at all. But uh, I'll just take the other side of it, non-scientific. I could break through with people I barely know. Yeah, uh, there you go, and that's, about, that's where it stops. Right. <laughs> you barely know them. That's it. And you don't think I get connect, accelerate that relationship successfully because it's a cyber relationship. You can. It's a way of, of de- sort of increasing the efficiency of the marketplace of making contact, but then getting... Getting friendships, developing relationships right. is something that you have to have a skill to do. And if you never develop that skill and never develop the understanding of the why you'd be motivated even to do it, you're not going to do it. One, on the other side, too, and I'm about to play a cut that's going to fo- fully back your, your point of view and Tucker's. But I can't tell you how many times I go up to my nieces or nephews and I'll say, hey, I wonder how such and such graduation won. Or I wonder if someone's picked a college. Or uh, are they still playing softball? And my answer is instant. Oh, yeah, they're still playing. I saw the picture of graduation. Ding, 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 they yeah. see me. Which I is information. Bro- it's sim- similar to how they understand um, knowledge. In other words, they don't understand the, the, the difference between information and wisdom, right? It's all information to them. But they never make the leap to the next level, which is experiential, which is learning how to apply. My knowledge and you know the what I do what I did for 15 years after medical school they don't understand what that part was because they only stand the information the information and that's just skating along the surface and the same applies to their relationships as to their relationship with information this uh, uh, Johan Harz wrote this book author author of lost connections Hari is that uh, uh, is that is that Johan Hari yeah okay. oh Hari yeah. okay my fault uh, connections between social media and social life yeah. let's listen I think the connection between social media and social life is a bit like the connection between pornography and sex. I'm not totally against pornography, but if your entire sex life consisted of looking at pornography, you'd be going around irritated and frustrated the whole time because that's yeah. not what we evolved for. We didn't exactly. evolve to look at screens for sex and we didn't evolve mm. to interact through screens. We evolved to interact face to face. And when you have a huge decline in that, that leads to a big increase in depression and anxiety. It's partly a symptom, right? Actually, loneliness have been supercharged already before the internet arrived. Part of what happens is the internet arrives and it looks a lot like the things we've lost, right? You've lost friends, well, here's some Facebook friends. You've lost status in the economy, here's some status updates. But it's not the thing we've lost. It's not filling the hole there. So, and you just, you're not, if you're watching Fox Nation, you see yeah. Dr. Drew nodding along. Johan and I have conflicted on a number of things, but that I agree with every single word he just uttered. Every single word. And, you know, there's another layer to it, too, which is it's, it's amplifying envy and unhappiness in addition to loneliness. Because there's all sorts of literature on happiness that shows that humans are perfectly happy with very little until they see somebody else with more. And that's all you see on the Internet is people with more. So you're cultivating unhappiness. You know what's interesting is uh, this is gradual. Unlike cars, one day I'm on a horse, next thing I know I want a car. Can I afford a car? The Model T, I can. But with this, I had the BlackBerry. No one was really using 
the internet on the BlackBerry was burdensome. No one was watching streaming things because it was so jumpy. Yes. But now I don't even know the difference between television and streaming and my texting. This gradually got hotter. I could talk to someone even 10 years ago and they'd yeah. go, it wasn't a problem with me, right? right? Was, We're in the middle of this. It, it happened pretty quickly. And, and, and I would argue that we will one day for, for adolescents and for, for middle schoolers, high schoolers, we will one day look at the screen the way we think about tobacco now. I really think so. We will be like, what? How? Why did we allow the kids to get access? To take it away when they come to school. Limit it at home. It's, it's dangerous. It has adverse health effects. It has certainly mental health effects. Let's curtail it. Everybody. And you know what? I could see it being possible if you told me 15 years ago that a generation would grow up and not be driving drunk. Almost, you'd see what the damage. See what dents we've made in DUIs. Yes, of course. And it got through. Yes. Everyone said, "Well, you're never going to change behavior." And then oh, people, yeah. were, I, I grew up. No one was wearing seatbelts. And then when they mandated it, people said, "No one's going to be wearing seat. They're not going to do it anyway. They're going to get rid of the buzzer sound. They're going to." But now everybody gets in with seatbelts. Right. And then I think you and I have spoken before about now that people are congregating and given, like Johan Hari just said, status. They're now forming mobs and they're acting out and they're acting out with aggression. It's really. Very unpleasant, very unhealthy, and not good. You know, it's it's highly democratic, but it's democratic in the way the Greeks worried about de democratization. Something that's going to implode on itself, mm -hmm. and and I think this is part of that. All right, this is a, you're one of these guests where you give me great ideas, even ones I didn't think of before you got here. But I'm going to bring you to the bigger society. Right. Uh, Brad Parscale, who's the six foot seven inch uh, election director for Donald Trump, he said to me, uh, "I go, what is with socialism?" He goes, "You know why." Because the word social gives us in, we're taking care of you. And wow. capitalism has a negative term. Isn't that interesting? But in reality, we know what socialism is. He said, I'm changing the verbiage to be more reality. I'm just talking about free, free markets as opposed to government control markets because that's what it is. I'm worried there's no net there. These people are stealing from me. They're taking more and more money from me, and I want to get some of that money from them, wealth tax, and I want to help my – I want to be able to not get uh, – pay my student loans and get a good job and have a big house. Mm -hmm. So they take from one to the other. We created an enemy over there. We're losing our fundamentals. Right. So creating an enemy, very powerful move. But isn't it interesting that the Trump – thing is thinking in terms of persuasion and language and really it's sort of neuro-linguistic processing there that's what they're Absolutely. talking about and so i don't social, know if i should have said that should i have said I, that out i think loud? that's i think it's great because oh, okay. that's what i assumed he was doing because so socialism has the word social and that's a very positive term today and capital that's capital it's like sounds like fascism and that's exactly how our brains work and so that's good they're doing that. They, we shouldn't allow those sorts of implicit wiring issues of our central nervous system to affect our thinking, but we do. Do you remember greed is good, power mm -hmm. of personal power? We yep. had the, the, the power of positive thinking was the fundamental. Thinking grow rich was the beginning of it. And then for a while, we're just talking about becoming successful. Anthony Robbins yes. comes to mind. Zig Ziglar comes to mind. All, all guys with use a lot of NLP and persuasion. Right. Yeah. And, and I don't see anything negative with that. And greed is good. People started looking at that a little differently. What changed? Uh, it's an interesting question. I, I, when the, what pops into my mind when you say what changes and the negative trend, the negative downslope, I always e – the easiest place for me to go is, well, our families have been just decaying for God knows how long. And, and that's a major, major issue. And you, it takes us back to our original conversation about relationships. If you don't have stable, connected, intimate relations over long periods of time in your home – you're doomed. It's really you can't regulate your emotions. You can't trust people. Society, because you don't like what happened at home, society becomes the enemy. Socialism starts looking really good because I need somebody to take care of me. I need to be part of something that I've never been a part of, and we long for that. That's it, man. We, we have to take better care of kids, bottom line. You know, Loveline, we did for years and years and years. All we heard about was trauma, trauma, trauma in the family. Finally, we woke up to that, but we still haven't really healed our the health of our family system. Right, and you were concerned when I first met you, and I was not the dominant anchor. Um, uh, you, Is that a euphemism was... for something? Not the dominant anchor? <laughs> Uh, you, don't give me credit. Uh, don't give me credit for being deeper than I am. All right, I, I like to think so. But I was I was not doing the interview. I wanted to meet you, and I don't know if I ever actually met you. But you, they came in. April did an interview with you while you were doing your radio show, in which she talked to you in the breaks. Yeah. And you said, "I'm concerned because I'm almost the number one caregiver for a lot of these people." The only and that connection was, they have. And yeah. I was out there in ninety two, ninety three. So yeah. that was a worry then. Oh, and it was all. Is, is all it, has it gotten worse kids. or better? better? The trauma. The side's gotten better. The, I mean, the, the, then literally all through the 90s and the early part of the 2000s, I was saying, look, we, every, 
Every call, sexual abuse, physical abuse, abandonment, neglect, chaos, every call. and the, You this, were taking that home, too, you said. Oh, my God. And this country was, like, unwilling to look at that. You, you're getting me going here. So what's, what's preoccupying me today, this, this, and so that has healed. So you've hit one of my hot buttons, which is the general health of our families and, the, and, we, and our relationships. But the other thing is... I live in the great state of California, the utopia that is California, which is a nightmare. And I'll give you case one, which are the people languishing and dying on the streets. I, I want to give you a prediction here. There will be a major infectious disease epidemic this summer in Los Angeles, and I mean really a problem. Uh, we have tens and tens of thousands of people living in tents, horrible conditions, sanitation, rat, oh, rats have taken over the city. We're the only city in the country, Los Angeles, without a rodent control program. We have multiple rodent-borne, flea-borne illnesses, plague, typhus. We're going to have louse-borne illness. If measles breaks into that population, we have tuberculosis exploding. And, the, and literally our politicians are like Nero. It's worse than Nero. It's like nothing I've ever seen in my life. I feel like I'm, I'm, on, I'm on a train track waving at the train, and the train's going to go off the bridge. I'm trying, the bridge is out, and the conductor's giving me the finger as he goes by. Here's what I want to do. I want to take away qualified immunity from the politicians so we can go after them for reckless negligence. This is disgusting. It is reckless negligence, and we have to be able to go after them. People are going to die by lo- right. many, many thousands. I'm here to predict it this summer in Los Name Angeles. the cities. Los Angeles, San Francisco, maybe San Diego. Right. Los Angeles is your number one problem. Um, do you know, I, I just happened to notice on Twitter today, Gavin Newsom came out and called on the federal government to solve it. Blamed them for the uh, homeless problem. What? And called on the federal government well, to do something. Well, if you want to blame the homeless, there's a great book called American Psychosis. You need to read it. If you want to blame the federal government, it was the Kennedy administration that uh, initiated the Community Mental Health Act. Great idea. They listened to an idiot group of psychiatrists who completely botched it, undid the state mental health system, and hmm, turned everybody out to the street. What do you think? Who are those people on the streets? They're, well, the, the ones that are disturbing and the ones that, that are becoming aggressive and violent and the ones that are in such horrible states, they're, just, they're the ones that are going to die of these infectious diseases are chronically mentally ill and being uncared for. And because the way the state's gravely disabled laws are written, you can't help them. You cannot do it. They have privileged psychiatric symptoms over everything else. So psychiatric symptoms are the most protected thought process in the land of California. So when you say, I think I'm Napoleon and you can't get away from me, I don't want your help. Hey, man. They're free to do what they want to do. Let them um, be. Unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, listen, I got him going. Uh, he's going to stick, yes, to, stick around Wound for a few more up. minutes. He's going to be on Fox <laughs> and Friends tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Drew, there's no one like him. And here's uh, we're going to go out to. Gavin Newsom's tweet. Where our federal lawmakers are falling short, California is taking the lead and fighting for more health care. No state in the country has uh, more on the line. That's true. All right. He, thank you. Thank you for creating it and then stating it. Back in a moment. Hey, uh, Dr. Drew is here. Uh, Dr. Drew is a board-certified uh, internist, addiction medicine specialist, host of KBC Midday Live. Not today, of course. Host of... Um, host of This Life, hashtag You Live Podcast, and co-host of Adam and Dr. Drew Show. So uh, you're doing it. To, every day you're on the air, right? Yeah, I do something. So the podcast allows you freedom to do it when you can. Yeah, correct? it's absolutely true. But, but I do a lot of podcasts. I have one. Right. I have, have you been Dark, able have have you been, uh, find, find out what's wrong with Adam Carolla emotionally, mentally? Well, it's funny you would bring that up because with peace and love, peace and love, uh, I love Adam. But I started doing uh, moral uh, – one of these uh, 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 where you sort of do thought experiments, morality thought experiments, like the, the famous trolley experiment. Which is? Which is you, you say to somebody, look, there's a trolley with five people heading down the tracks. You can pull a lever and save their lives, but it's going to send the track over, the, the train over, to, and it will kill one guy, but it'll save five lives. Can you pull the lever? vast majority of people say yes. Now, now you're up on a bridge. There's a guy standing next to you. You can push him off onto the tracks. It'll save the five lives. Will you do it? I, I couldn't do that. Adam immediately goes, yes. And then I went, well, what if it was your son standing next to you? He goes, I have to push him over. It's just math. <laughs> like, Whoa. Well, I just learned a lot about you. So I have a bunch of other morality experiments I want to do with him. But, but I think he, he's missing a piece of his brain but, but where it's is, all a math ex- equation. But he is a great guy, you know. He's and he's, a great guy. And he's brilliant. brilliant. And he yeah. did not have an easy life. He had no. plenty of excuses to grow up. Now, I hear this is how political things are. Him and Jimmy Kimmel have a rift because he does not understand how Adam could uh, support Donald Trump. I, I don't see the rift. I tell you who has a – because they're still buddies. The, the rift is between Adam and David Allen Greer. 
that's that's a sad one for me. Uh, and, and David Allen Greer, they've been longtime friends. Longtime friends. And, and, and Dag just said he just can't be around Adam's rhetoric, which is that's sad. That's sad. I thought we just we had friendships. We didn't. Either, we shouldn't discuss politics at the dinner table, right? Right. Just just let it be. I would think so, uh, Doctor Drew. I want to bring you to something else, and this is Congresswoman Underwood. She's a freshman, uh, Congresswoman, and she. I've just told you what's happening at the border. You have all these people coming through. Border Patrol agents can only spend sixty percent of, of work on the border. The other forty percent are changing diapers, getting orange drinks, and doing things for them. Here's Congresswoman Underwood. When they went up to find out the status, this guy's desperate for more funding and to change the laws to stop three countries from emptying out into ours and going ahead of all the other people seeking justified asylum. Or, or even it. just 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 regular immigration, right? Regular. Yeah. It, it's cut 20. This is obviously more than a question of resources. Congress has been more than willing to provide the resources and work with you to, to address Not true. the security and humanitarian concerns. But at this point, with five kids that have died, 5,000 separated from their families, I feel like, and the evidence... Um, is really clear that this is intentional. It's intentional. It's a policy choice being made on purpose by this administration, and it's cruel and inhumane. And when Mike Rogers went on to say, it's basically, and it was with Kevin McElhane, and said, really, you, you're accusing me by design of murdering children. I, I Knowing that funding is the problem and the change in the laws, we've done it. I know. I don't, I don't understand. we we, we got to start. Here, here's my fundamental note. Politicians, stop worrying about your ideology and your rhetoric and your political capital. And please help the citizens of the United States. Will you do your damn job and please help us? We are desperate for help. Uh, no more than in California, worse in Los Angeles. Uh, it's, it's negligent, most of what the ICR politicians doing. I, I, we have to take away their qualified immunity so we just go after it. You or I, we do something negligent. You don't think you're going to be held accountable Absolutely. civilly and criminally? The only, there are two pe groups of people that will not. Police. And politicians, we got either we all need to get qualified immunity or nobody gets qualified. And, immunity. I, and I'll tell you, we'll listen to the National Guard's been brought to the border. And one guy puts up his hand, and asks the secretary of defense, he said, I'm from Kentucky. Why am I having why am I? I was just in California. Why do I have to go work California's border? Right. California's governor pulled the National Guard yes, off the border and I said know. there's no problem. Yeah. And That's then got angry when uh, the, the administration wanted to send the illegal immigrants over to us. Well, which are we? Are we a sanctuary? Or are we not? If we're sanctuary, hey, send them. I, that's what we've created here in California. Just send them, send them on. That's what we want. So, what do you say? To people say, well, you don't have a good, you have a hard heart if you're telling these people uh, that they can't stay. I, I just, it's just unfortunate. I love to embrace everybody. Let's cure the world. I'm all for it. Is there something immoral about a, a, a caring about Americans more than people no, in other countries? No, I think you have to, it's called setting priorities. You have to set priorities in life. Unfortunately, that's the way it goes. Dr. Drew, you've helped me so much. Can I help you with anything? Do you have any problems that only I can handle? Uh, I need a ride home. Can that, you help me with that? You say, okay, fine. <laughs> so, I was thinking more emotion, but I'll... I'll no, I just I have around that... you, Brian. <laughs> this fills me with joy. She's lying. <laughs>